Good day to you as the sun is shining over my head, and a good day it is outside anyhow, and a long needed one. You know, I'm walking to campus again for our video today, and as a walker, or a driver, or a bicycle rider, or really anybody who moves around, you're a passerby. You're somebody who passes by things and takes interest in things. And so media should be no different than anything else in your lives if it catches your attention. And so that's how we're heading into today's chapter because it's all about, for the first time, human beings. It's about media audiences. It's about a part that's not part of the tree but is very close to the tree. It's that part of the tree that, that people pass by and decide to take a look at and when they see the leaves, they pick the content. And so, as we head into our final last two weeks of class, we're finally bringing it all to a head and bringing up all of the elements into some singular, broader concepts. And that's the approach that I wanna take in today's instructional video. So let's start first with the trouble of the audience, because the audience is a term that's not only commonly used, by media companies and by scholars, teachers like myself talking about people who watch TV, listen to radio, text others, etc., etc., use media, we call them audiences when in actual fact, an audience is a very artificial construct, construct because people just don't communicate in real time very much more in for media audiences. I mean, the average Snapchat that goes around is going around for days sometimes, and nobody's watching it at exactly the same time. Some are watching it pretty close to each other, some are not. Same holds true for TV. People are Netflix binging whenever they want. In radio, you've got your stuff on your phone. Play it back through your car radio, wireless. You know what I'm saying. I hope that the concept of an audience is really artificial because when you are talking about an audience in mass media, you're talking about X million people watching some TV show or X thousands people reading a newspaper or listening to a radio station, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just artificial. But with that out of the way, we can still talk about how people in general are, how should we say, being who they are through the media that they're exposed to in the countries that they've grown up in. So let's start by summing up the countries this way this week. Let's talk about the U.S. first, because we've already talked about it in many different cases, and it is the country that we are, for most of us, anyhow, taking this class in. Who knows? It isn't a distance ed long online class, but we do know that in the United States, if you grow up, what you're going to likely see, have access to, bump into, etc., as an audience member, are a lot of ads, a lot of commercials, a lot of ads in newspapers, TV, radio. There's just a lot of things being sold in the United States media. And once again, not that that doesn't happen elsewhere in the world, but the extent to which you are likely to come upon an advertising when you turn on the radio and you turn on the TV, sometimes seems like better than 50%, doesn't it? Sometimes 100% if you really just hit a block, but overall, you're gonna run into a lot of ads in the US. We also know though that we have a lot of variety in this country. We do have a lot of variety in our political discourse, in our vehicles of entertainment, ranging from TMZ revealing personal information about Bruce Jenner and other celebrities, over to reruns of Nickelodeon shows. We have a lot of entertainment. And then we know that a lot of our media are going to other countries around the world. We know that the U.S. is super big exporter. And you can find our newspapers and a lot of our TV shows and a lot of our singers and songs, of course, and just a whole bunch of other American stuff, including film, all over the world, even in the smallest of countries. We also know that in the U.S., violence is something that we kind of take as a regular occurrence in our media content, but it tends to be, how should we say, sort of screened out. We, we prefer violence in fictional things like films and Netflix uh, shows and even some regular TV shows, of course, but we don't expect to see that violence on the news, not to the extent where we're going to see somebody, an actual human being, who has been mutilated and see the blood. 
but we do have a lot of violence. Sex-wise, we are one of the more prohibitive countries compared to the other countries. China and others are a little bit, well, quite a bit more um, restricted. But certainly in comparison to the European countries, we have a lot, a lot of hard, fast rules about broadcasting obscene slash sexual slash explicit profane content. Now moving to Europe, let's talk about these three countries together because they really share so many characteristics which makes them European. We can say that in general Sweden, the UK, and, and France are countries that have a lot more public media content that they bump into and that is available and that they actually choose to watch. Because the public media content isn't quite so... I don't want to use the word elitist, but that's the best one that's coming to my mind, as American NPR is. And that's a very elitist kind of media. The public media in Europe are not quite that way. That's why we, there is a, a British pop station that's provided for by the BBC. It's for young people to listen to. So the point there is Europe gets a lot of public media. We also know that some of the newspapers in, in Europe, at least... Um, in the in the past, maybe not so much today, but it still exists. The newspapers are partisan. That means they belong to a cause or have a, a particular point of view, and then everything just sort of flows into that particular point of view. We also know that people see a lot more documentaries in the UK and France and Sweden on real life situations. You know, a couple that goes into debt, and then how do they get out of debt, and all the intricacies, and what are they going to do? Yeah, we have shows like that, cooking shows, home improvement, but it's a little bit different in, in Europe. They take average people situations and make them interesting in documentaries. And of course, we know that they have very different controls when it comes to sex and violence. They're more permissive, permissive with sex, um, profanity as well, and really anything doing with that whole area, as long as it is included in content that would be considered to be um, authentic to a real-life situation that is not gratuitous. On the other hand, we also know that in those European countries, they are not keen on violence, not as keen. They do have some things in control, Sweden more than the others, to prevent violent content, mindless violent content, they might say, coming into their countries. They'll allow it in their news programs when they are covering war or a car accident, to show the reality of, of human horror, but in fictional programming, there are more controls, generally speaking. Which brings us now to China. China can pretty much be summed up as government programming and government content, really. So whatever the government allows, that's what you get in China, and that means a lot of homegrown content, a lot of Chinese cultural content, a lot of really upscale, classical, high-performing arts kind of content, Chinese operas, if you read about those, hopefully. We also know that in China, at the same time, they have a lot of advertising going on, which makes them a really unique country because it's a communist country experimenting with a strong profit motive, making it capitalistic in some ways. A very strange combination of the two, but it's very in very, very strict areas. It's in certain newspapers, private newspapers, and radio. And we also know, of course, that there is very, very little criticism allowed in China. Certainly no criticism of the National Party uh, because it's, it's unneeded. It's, 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 uh, there's, un, there's no need for it because China has only one true real political philosophy is communism. So if there are no others, why put it down? That's one way of interpreting it. Uh, now moving to Ghana. Ghana, you know, Ghana has very spotty broadcasting. You still don't have a 24-hour, 20 hours, seven days a week, 365 TV programming selection. That's really big. Station sign off, sign back on. They run a lot of home, really homegrown, basic content. Two people in a studio talking about issues. We know finally about Ghana that radio is huge. 
in Ghana uh, because of the tribalism, the oral languages, and really the infrastructure of, of roads and highways. Radio is the biggest medium in Ghana. Now that leaves us with Lebanon. Lebanon, the way I would phrase it for today, is has a very splintered media system, to say the least. I mean, it's a tiny country to begin with, and then within that, there are so many, so many sects. S-E-C-T-S, not S-E-X. Sex. There are so many sects. Religious and some non-religious, some just plain political, some movement-oriented. It's so fragmented in Lebanon. And you have a government that does have quite a few controls in place, but they don't have the means of enforcing those controls. So there's a lot of buying off media companies. There's a lot of political handshakes behind the scenes and you end up with a kind of content that is really what the people with the money are able to get on the air. Um, at the same time, there are lots of restrictions because of this tiny country's very precarious position in the Middle East, um, being surrounded by a lot of turbulence, you know, Syria, <laughs> uh, Iraq, Iran, etc. So, I'm going to be stopping the video in just a moment because this part of the journey of exploring media systems is where I wanted to go with today and pick up from the very end of this chapter that will be a good intro, I think, for our final instructor video when we talk next. Have a great day.